This is Mystery Mike from Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour Podcast. Thank you for joining Jeff, a.k.a. Podcast Father, on this journey sharing great things content creators are doing. He's the indie podcaster. You've been searching for a podcast. (laughs) Want to know about some great artist? You've come to the right place. Indie podcaster. With your host, the podcast father. Give me a hell yeah! It's indie podcaster time. And of course, I am Jeff Townsend, your indie podcast father. Loving, representing all great independent content creators. Well, I try, right? I can't actually meet all of them. But damn it, I would if I could, and I will not stop until I do. How does that sound? All right, we'll get back to the subject matter at hand here. You are tuning in to another episode of Indie Podcaster. I want to thank you personally for listening to this podcast. And I've got a pretty cool episode lined out today. I had an awesome, I mean, just fantastic conversation with Kristen Vermeulen. She has a podcast, Makers of the USA. Actually, we tried to get together and schedule this and and get it recorded forever. (laughs) A lot of uh, cancellations and rescheduling and et cetera. So when we could actually meet and do this interview, it was incredible. And I think she is an awesome person and has an awesome podcast where she actually talks to people who are making things. This is a cool conversation. We have a lot of good talk about community and, and how she started her podcast and stuff like that. But Also, she's recently been working on a pilot for getting this change into a television series. So it's kind of cool to hear that side of it, too, like how it's different, you know, the video piece of of television compared to making a podcast. So, again, I'm excited to share this conversation with you. I really am. I don't want to hold it up any longer. So let's jump into it. But we got to knock out that business first. That's right. I'll say it again. One more time. Business. Seriously, this podcast would not exist if it wasn't for the awesome love that you guys show me in the content creator community. If you're not in contact with me and you would like to be or you'd like to be featured on this podcast, you can go about this in a couple different ways. If you just want to chat with me, hit me up on Twitter at podcast underscore father. Hit up my website, podcastfather.com. There you will also find a form that you can fill out to be featured on this very podcast. If you really love what I'm doing, you know, I just would love it if you subscribe to this podcast. I'm going to share some sponsors with you. They do help me keep making this podcast. But more importantly, these are great tools that independent podcasters should be using. PodPage, you can build a beautiful podcast website literally in less than five minutes, guys. It's amazing. It uses your RSS feed and it automatically creates all of this. You can customize it and do all the different things you want to do. There's all sorts of different packages. You've got to have a website if you're a podcaster or content creator. You have to. Go to podpage.com. Use my code FATHER. This will get you $20 off any pro package. One of the big challenges for new podcasters is marketing your podcast. Do you need help doing that? Well, I've got the solution for you. My friends at Podspike make marketing your podcast easy, affordable, and effective. They work with you. They pull the legwork. They connect you with all these different resources that you get to choose from. Go to podspike.com. Use the code IndiePodcaster. You'll get $20 off your first month of a pro membership. As a podcaster, it's very important to make sure you got a transcript going on for all your episodes. It really is. And my friend, at Podden have the ultimate tools to do that. Make your podcast to eye-catching transcript with ease. You really need to get to it. Go to podden.io. All right, let's get into this conversation, which happens to be powered by Riverside.fm. Kristen, I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. We've been trying to do this for, I don't, it's probably literally like six months. I'm not even over-exaggerating. We've had to like cancel a couple of times, but six months at least we've been trying to have this. So, Yes, thank you for having me. I feel like the family life has had its challenges in the midst of COVID. So I appreciate you taking the time to, to finally interview me. <laughs> no problem. And we finally figured out like how we connected. So it was through, and I guess it all started with JJ Ramberg at Good Pods and some emails were sent and it branched out. Then you have a podcast, so we're connected here. Yes. I will give you a minute to... You know, tell us about yourself and what you're doing. So I'm Kristen Vermeulen. I am the practically the host and founder of Makers of the USA, which was actually Makers of Maine. 
I started the podcast at the beginning of the pandemic. I just had my second child and I was losing all of my clients as a publicist. And I thought, hey, you know, I might as well start something that's very different, that's not out there in the world in terms of a podcast that talks about makers and crafting here in America. But I wanted to start slow. So I started in the state of Maine because Maine encompasses over 99.2% of small businesses. And I really wanted to give back to those that are crafting with their hands or have creative minds, make us such a broad term. And I wanted to interview people who have such valuable stories. So that's what I did. I started it as a digital interview process. And then I decided, well, in order for folks to see their studios, their craft, their make, I decided to go and travel to these places and be a traveling podcast. So that's sort of the gist of, you know, what I'm doing right now. It's great to tell stories of some fabulous entrepreneurs here in the state and around the nation. I know that when like we had chatted originally, like that was the cool thing because we're not doing like the same thing, but like I always use the term and it's probably ridiculous, like mom and pop businesses, entrepreneurs, like you're saying, like my podcast is for like independent podcasters. And what you're doing is like the independent podcasters, the working world, right? Like you said. So it's super cool. And I know that we connected with that early. So you started this, you said at the beginning of the pandemic, like you had to be thinking about it for a while though, to want to do something like this. Did you have any experience with creating content before or anything? Yeah. So I'm a publicist full time. So I go and represent small mom and pops up in Maine, as well as up and down the East coast. I'm originally from Maryland. So I come from the PR world and government uh, relations. I worked for Department of Defense for a little while. When I came to Maine, I learned more about the small business side of things. And I said, well, hey, why not start my own business in the publicity world and creating content to throw out to other media outlets about these wonderful businesses? And I focused mainly on people who craft products from beauty, fashion, accessories, woodworking, metalwork, jewelry, just anything you can think of when it comes to products. And it's just amazing that I got to learn more about this. So that's really where my content creation sort of stemmed from, which led me to creating my own media outlet. I never thought I would be on the other side of a media outlet. Usually I'm the one that's pitching to media outlets. Now I have my own. So, I mean, it ties into what you're doing, right? I mean, with your, it also serves a business purpose, which is awesome, which I feel like a lot of people that just start out podcasting, doing it with their friend or something, you know, don't realize that some people are actually trying to connect things as a business. Right. It's true. Like, I'm so happy that I have a passion for supporting these small businesses and going into the idea of starting a podcast. It just made sense because I think a lot of people can appreciate the podcasting world because it's long form content and they're able to share their story in a longer way rather than sharing a snippet of it on television or a magazine or even a digital publication. There's only so many words and so much you can say on television to really share your story. So with a podcast, I really like to feel somebody out in terms of their story, what questions they're comfortable in answering, giving them a guide as to like what we're going to be discussing. So you can really like steer people in the right direction, but also make it comfortable because it's audio and you can edit it too, right? Um, So that's really sort of the passion point there was I really just wanted to utilize this podcasting platform to share these unique stories because this platform's so popular now. The maker's part of it. I understand it being like, uh, kind of has like a hands-on feeling to it. What's behind that exactly? So the maker side of it, I mean, geez, while yes, there are tons of makers that handcraft products. So that whether that be basket weaving, creating beautiful baskets or jewelry with, you know, metalwork and blacksmithing with axes, there's a whole other element of make such as musicians, videographers, photographers, storytellers, like we do for a living in Mm -hmm. terms of this podcasting world. But also people who create experiences. So I actually got to interview this captain. He's the captain of a windjammer, which is a schooner up here in Maine. And what's amazing is that these captains are makers themselves because they go and maintain their own boats. There's not a typical, you know, boat company that goes and modifies and maintains these big, tall ships. So these captains have molded themselves to be makers to maintain their boats and to take care of them to keep that tradition and that history floating, literally. 
So uh, yeah, it's been amazing to kind of broaden that scope. But at the same time, too, some people are really passionate about learning the process behind making something. So you get a lot of that out of my podcast as well and learning about the steps and elementary steps into the craft. Because like when I went into this, I interviewed an axe maker and I got to learn how to craft an axe. And I still am learning day to day because there's so many details behind it, but it really is an art form. So it's really cool to kind of hear that from a maker's perspective. But I help sort of gravitate towards the elementary side of it because sometimes these makers speak their own language and you need to take a step back and forming and telling them, hey, you may want to tone it up to be a more elementary level because that's what an audience needs in terms of this podcast. I love the word. And I know earlier you like you said makers because it's like it's kind of like a broad you can go anywhere with it. Right. But it's also like unique, like to me, like there's so many other words that a person would normally choose besides that. So I, I absolutely love it. And I think it's awesome that you chose that word. Thank it definitely you. stands out and it's unique, but it's, I'm going to say it's strange, but it's odd that you chose that word, but it works for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's different. And, you know, I go back and forth on the term maker and craft, because when you think of the term craft, you're thinking of like arts and crafts or, you know, craft beer. So I feel like craft in and of itself kind of intertwines with make and I, you can make it a broad definition. But I think it's all about education. And that's what I'm trying to do is educate people that, hey, it can be a broader definition. You got to think of it in a different light. You say craft, I think of glitter all over my damn house. (laughs) Those kids. Yes, I know what you mean. I can relate. (laughs) Having a bunch of girls, they love getting that glitter everywhere. Yes. So hard to get out of things too. (laughs) It is. It just, it's like glue. It's insane. That and the slime. Slime's the big thing too, you know, like let's make slime. (laughs) Let's put glitter on it. <laughs> I'm like, no. Yeah, the worst thing to do. I'm like, stick to crayons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What happened to crayons the old days? Yeah, I for know, sure. I know. <laughs> first episode. Let's talk about the first episode. Is that the one you're talking about with the axe? No. So that was probably a couple episodes in. But the reason why I'm talking about the axe one so much is actually my podcast is being turned into a television series. And we just finished the pilot episode and the ax makers are part of that pilot episode. So that always comes to mind because like their story is like wrapped in my brain because that's all we've been talking about for the past month is this these ax makers and them being a part of this pilot. But going back to my first episode, I actually interviewed one of my former clients. She handcrafts leather handbags with dock line rope and with metal fixtures that kind of wrap it all around and bring it together. And she is also the owner and founder of a creative agency. It's like a web services agency called I Bet Creative here in Portland, Maine. And the reason why I chose her to kind of really kick this off is that she's a female entrepreneur. She has a side hustle alongside this big agency that I think she's got over 20 employees that like take on all these clients. And she built that from the ground up. And now she's got this side hustle where it's like hands on craft of turning you know, something, a drawing or something that she is, and it was inspired by and putting it like to a product. Like she has a sewing team. She has a design team. She's made crossover handbags, like, you know, big handbags, um, but it's all nautical inspired. And that really is the flow of Maine. Like that's a big piece of Maine. So I was really glad to give back to her in that way, just because she was kind of going through a rough patch in terms of COVID. Every small business was. So it's like a matter of let's really hear their story in a different light. And how can we support them to continue their craft here in our nation? Because a lot of people buy products from China and you know all these other countries, which is why we're dealing with supply chain issues right now. It's just really hard. So I think that's another reason why I started this podcast is this perfect timing, because this shows that there's a lot of makers here that can really, you can find a solution in what you're trying to find when it comes to manufacturing and finding a replacement, you may have to spend a little more to get it. But it's really nice to hear that there are a lot of makers here in America, right in our backyards that can fulfill a need. Just like every website needs a home on the internet, so does your podcast. And that's why I'm going to tell you about my pals at Podtrix. Podtrix is a new podcast hosting provider focused on keeping the creators creative. Because at the end of the day, that is the most important thing. The focus for the creator needs to be on creating the content. 
and having a podcast host like Podtrix allows you to do that. Starting at a plus plan, Podtrix allows you to create unlimited shows. Yes, that's right, unlimited shows. No matter what your plan selection is, though, you can create unlimited episodes. Podtrix supports adding multiple users, and you actually get a pick and decide what access each individual has. This is a big deal. I'll tell you a story real quick. It's probably five years ago. My friends and I had a podcast, and... My friend got on there accidentally on the podcast hosting and deleted the whole entire freaking podcast. Well, if I would have had Podtrix back then, this wouldn't have happened because he would have never had access to it. And I think Podtrix offers a lot of big upcoming features too, because this really is a platform from an independent creator for independent creators. Another cool thing here, the trials are not limited because Podtrix does not want to rush your creative process. However long it takes for you to be ready is how long Podtrix will be waiting to help you be successful. They are offering a special discount to the listeners of this podcast. If you use the promo code IndiePod, you will get 25% off your first three months of any Podtrix plan. Free trials may not have a timeline, but this offer does. This promo code is valid until May 31st at the end of the day. So you should get on this as quick as you can. Get on it right now. Go to podtrix.com slash podcaster, use the promo code, and get started with Podtrix. Yeah, it, it's really important to support, you know, American things. And then like even more so like local things, right? Like in our community. So that's a really cool inspiration to also like start the podcast because I think that's been so lost over time, this whole supporting the local things. I know I see it where I live, where they just kind of go away and it just becomes a way of life and everything's just changed. So super cool. Yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, I know a lot of makers out in Indiana, like I know that's where where you reside. And it's amazing that I have gotten built this platform from the bottom up. And I've gotten such recognition from like, national TV, like Good Morning America and Fox Business News, which has been awesome. And it's been great because these makers find out about me, and they're reaching out to me from all over the place. This is why I went national. And, you know, every state has a maker of some sort with a unique story, every single state. I'm just mind blown because I never would have known that if it wasn't for me starting and voicing this and really like getting this community together. Cause that's a big part of this project is to really bring all these makers together and them communicating and jibing and feeling out what they're dealing with in terms of challenges or successes. So I hope that continues. I do want to get into like some of the national things that you've done in a little bit, but going back to the first episode, I, in my head, when she, even though like I went back and I looked at your catalog, I didn't listen to the first episode. I listened to more recent ones. And like I said, we've tried to do this like three times. So right, always, I know. I've been trying to get caught up too, but it would be crazy if that X one was the first one. So I was like picturing in my head, like you putting all your podcast equipment in a bag and taking <laughs> it to this X man and how incredible that would be. But it's cool that you're going on site with a lot of that stuff too, because everybody was doing the exact opposite during that. Does that you think that like gave your podcast an advantage? I think so, because I not only see myself as a podcast host and a traveling podcaster, I also created this sort of media outlet, if you will. So I hire photographers and videographers to go along with me to showcase their work and creative along with shooting that subject matter, whether that be an axe maker, fashion designer, whatever that is. And I love seeing that because I find that that editorial process, that connection showing beginning to end sort of what the photographer has captured in regards to the subject matter. But then also I go and interview them too. I have a mini series that's called Behind the Lens and I interview the photographers and videographers that I partner with. So it's really cool to kind of like experience sort of laying out the entire editorial process into my podcast. And Also, having such creative assets to go along with that story is super beneficial. So not only is the podcast like an audio visual of the craft, I have, um, there's like articles and pictures to go along with it on my website, as well as my social media. So you can really kind of see the craft in other ways. And I find that I have multiple audiences because not necessarily everybody listens to the podcast. They just go on my website, they read it, and then they look at the visuals or they go on my social media and they read the content there and see the visuals. So it's been really interesting to dabble into like multiple marketing platforms to really promote a vision, a mission really with this project. It's awesome. Talk to us about the beginning. Like what were some of the challenges besides like the obvious going on on site? Like 
you picked up this podcast with podcasting this time. What was the challenges? What were some of them? Uh, Some of the challenges, to be honest with you, the audio kind of leveling and figuring all of that out was really challenging. Finding the right room to be in. I got kids at home and trying to record. It could be super challenging to kind of figure that out. And, you know, my audio at first wasn't the best when it comes to the actual interviews. You're going to them like that has to be hard. Oh, I know. Yeah, definitely. Well, at first I did digital. That was the first couple episodes because with COVID in mind, I was like, I want to respect that, make people comfortable. But then as I got to go on site, it got better, which was awesome. But it still had its like moments. And I was doing my own audio leveling. Like I didn't have an audio engineer at first, but now I do. So it's funny when you go and listen back to the very first episode up until now, there's like a big improvement, big, big, big improvement. But another challenge that I had though too was in being a media outlet and working with photographers and videographers, you have to have like contracts in place to make sure that, you know, you are on the same page and that you have an agreement going into it being like how you utilize those assets, like those photos and videos and on your website with press, with anything. And I think that really nipped me in the butt in the first place because I had no idea going into it that I needed to have a contract with these individuals. I thought it was just a mutual agreement. So that was a hard lesson to learn. I had to go and spend a lot of money because I didn't have any sponsors in the beginning. So I pretty much took that out of my own wallet and paying some of these people and they deserved it totally. But I think what I recommend to anybody that's getting into any type of media outlet business, or if you want a photographer, or videographer on board is to have a contract in place because that just makes life a heck of a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> makes perfect sense. Yeah. I guess my thing is like, you had to go in this with like some sort of like larger aspiration, like was that part of the plan? Because you had like a lot of resources at the beginning, more than maybe like the average person did. How long did it take you to come up with this concept and what you were going to do? Because it seems well thought out. And like I said, you put a lot of resources into it. Ah, oh, man, I would say that it took me a good year. So that prior to really launching that first episode, I really had to document sort of what my vision was, which is very helpful. I find that having a podcast strategy or a media outlet strategy going into it and outlining sort of what's the vision, what are your goals out of it? Because I'm such an innovative thinker. I go all over the place when it comes to strategy that I need to bring it down and scale it back. So I think that allowed me to figure out, okay, let's tackle Maine first. Let's really, really make it perfect and making sure that I can travel to these places in a comfortable manner. I can really capture good content and good storytelling. I can capture visuals and video. So that was sort of like the pilot. And then all of a sudden, as I started getting more publicity out of it, because that is my full-time job, is to help makers and small businesses get their name out there to media outlets. I did it for myself and sharing my own story. So as I can continue to do that, Then everybody that was reaching out to me is like, please go national because there are so many other makers out there outside of Maine that need to be, their stories need to be told too. So I feel like having the strategy moving forward and not having many resources. I mean, like I got the resources more as I added more sponsors into the mix. So I started being strategic and figuring out what types of sponsors would mesh well with my concept. And I didn't want the makers and small businesses to pay to be sponsors. That was not my goal. I wanted to give back to them. So I said, okay, I'm just going to partner with those that really flow well with my story. So I partnered with Berlin City Auto Group, their car dealership here in Maine. And I go and utilize their cars to travel to all of these places. So it wrapped really nicely with the storytelling. Um, I also partnered with a credit union that supports small businesses and makers and the community here in Maine. So that was very nice and free-flowing in regards to my story. So it was very strategic. That's what built sort of my sponsorship agreements and having those dollars to help sort of pay photographers and videographers to capture that, but then also getting the right equipment. So everything kind of just fell into place after rolling out this pilot. And then it's just continued to expand from there. Now with the national side of it, it's just, you know... Now I'm having to rethink things, be like, all right, what can I do? How do I expand strategically? What types of sponsors do I get on? So it's like rethinking everything again. And it has its challenges for sure, but I'm working through it. (laughs) Spectacular to talk about the significance of like a relative like sponsor, like you said, because 
it's the same thing with this podcast. I've been able to have sponsors that obviously all relate to podcasting, right? Because you've listened to the podcast and you can probably guess a lot of people that do are podcasters. So, I mean, it makes sense that like Riverside, like what we're on right now would be a sponsor. Right. Any drop in pod page, just things that are resources for podcasters. So, and that is a great thing. You don't need like a million downloads to get a sponsor, right? Like that's kind of like a misconception, but it's great to team up with those kind of things. And then whatever you get from that, take that, then put it back towards resources to improve or go towards the work that you're doing. And that's what you did to help grow in the beginning. Right. You're exactly right. And you know, I had this question asked the other day to me was that how much money that you're getting from your sponsors is going to you, like your time and your resources and like going towards your personal life. And I told people none, because honestly, this project is about giving back to the makers. So what I do is I use those funds to go and partner with creatives to give myself the assets to showcase their work. But then also I work out a deal with the photographers and videographers saying, hey, I want the makers to get these images too, so they can use them because that type of work is really expensive. And if I have those resources to really help lift them up, then might as well do that. And then also with equipment, like that's what you need to kind of tell those stories. So I just tell people, yeah, it's not going into my own account. I wish it was, but it just hasn't been. And that's fine. I'm fine with that. I think I'd rather give back more than putting it into my own pocket. And if you're in a position to be able to do that, that's even better. Like that you make that decision, like I can do this, so I'm going to. It's definitely a good thing. Yeah. What are some other things you did to kind of grow in the beginning? Because you haven't been doing this specific thing forever. I mean, you're what, less than a couple of years now. So yeah. what are some other things? And like we said, a lot of podcasters listen. So what are some other little tricks and things that you did to help get you some momentum early on? So I partnered with the best people. So I find that my guests that I've had on the podcast and having them share the love of the episodes that I've launched in collaboration with them. That's how I built my audience organically was through those individuals. But then also, I went and partnered with nonprofits in the area that have a passion for craft and make. There's a lot of nonprofits here in Maine in particular that really helped lift my voice, including Maine Craft Association. I actually helped them with a whole Maine Craft Weekend event, interviewing makers and getting them to tell their stories and really promoting people to go to those studios to support them or buy products for them or get to know them, like email them, like, and saying, thank you for doing what you're doing. Like it was a very uplifting event and an uplifting storytelling series. So I find that if you find the right people to really help build up your audience and that really believe in you, I think that's a value. So that's kind of another valuable tip that has carried with me throughout this entire journey is to really build a good network because that can really, really help lift you. And even my sponsors, I have to say, like after, you know, growing my initial audience, the sponsors just really have helped me grow too and sharing that content with their following too. It's like a win-win situation for everybody. Yeah, it's like the best part about networking. It's, I don't want to say it's endless possibilities, but it can take you in so many different directions and open up so many new things. So it's a really important thing. Like, obviously you got to focus on your content first. But you got to have like smart, strategic networking for growth organically. And then once you've got the organic kind of leads to other things. And then obviously, if you got that, then you're going to continue to get more organic as well. So you have probably heard of promo swaps with other podcasters. But have you heard of feed drops? Feed drops are when one podcaster plays an entire episode of another podcast. The idea is for the listeners of the show to experience an entire episode before they decide if they want to subscribe. I'm going to tell you what, this is way more effective than promo swaps, and I have the perfect person that can do this for you, my good friend Greg at Indie Drop-In Network. Indie Drop-In Network is a network built around feed drops. You submit an episode, and if approved, it appears on one of Indie Drop-In's shows with all your contact details in front of established audience. Best of all, it's free. So if you are a true crime, paranormal, scary, or comedy podcaster looking to find new listeners, consider doing this. I've done it and I can tell you it does work. What the hell are you waiting for? I should probably tell you how to do it. Maybe that's what you're waiting for. Go to IndieDropIn.com slash creators. I'll say it again. Go to IndieDropIn.com slash creators. 
You're damn right. Dang, that felt good. You keep saying the word uplifting. So it seems like to me that like, obviously you're very passionate. It seems like you probably had a really good support system. Like what made you who you are to like want to do this? Does that make sense what I'm asking? Because you have really supportive parents. Like you're very passionate, I can tell. And that's, I don't want to say that's rare, but that seems to be like it deep into somebody's roots, right? It's, Mm -hmm. we'll use the word organic again. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. So growing up, I grew up in a town called Ellicott City, Maryland, and I worked at antique shops. I've helped my grandmother out in Indiana make quilts. I've gotten my hands on so many crafting things growing up. I wouldn't consider myself a great craftswoman, but I find it so amazing to see this. Like, it's because I think people, they tend to be on their phones a lot. The technology scene is just like crazy. Everyone just in front of screens all the time. And with having young kids, I want to go and show them there's a lot more to this world than just technology. Getting your hands on something, learning how to sew, knit, learning how to sing, dance, like learning how to share stories, like even though there is some technology behind it, especially with a podcast. But I think having that creative flow going through your brain is super beneficial to anybody. And I learned that as I grew up, I mean, I played volleyball. I was into sports growing up. I used to sing in a band and, you know, high school, loved it. And then I also, you know, really enjoyed learning other craft from other people. You know, I grew up with a woman that she's Hindu and her entire family would sit down and have music nights at her house every Friday night. And I would join in and learn about the instruments that I've never heard of before, sing songs that I didn't even know what they were about because we were in a different language. But it was just great to just really wrap my head around craft of all different diversity lifestyles. So I hope that this podcast grows even further than America because there is so much craft and make throughout this entire world. And I think we're not the only ones that are going through the screen tech craziness. I know there's a lot of other people out there that are doing that in other countries. And it's like, what happened to, you know, the creative flow? Let's take a break from the screen. So I would say that is the biggest thing in my upbringing, because I just don't want people to forget about that. And I'm so afraid they are even my own kids. Yeah. I mean, my daughter was like a master on my phone at the age of one. So <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not hard to go down that rabbit hole by any means. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, also too, I was alongside my mom growing up being, she's an entrepreneur, always been in sales and marketing, and she helped mold me into the entrepreneur that I am today always been a support system in terms of like, she's like, you know what, you're going to go to a four-year college. And I said, yep, I'm going to work my butt off and trying to do that. And I did. And she encouraged me and she said, okay, you're going to do internships. Like you're going to get out there. And if they're paid, great. If they're not paid, so what? Like just, and she encouraged me and got me out there every summer. And I had great jobs, great opportunity, dabbled into so many different industries And then I'm here today. And I can't believe I have two businesses now. I never thought the podcast would be a profitable business. You know, I never thought I would make money off of it. That gives back to the makers. But like, I am so grateful for, you know, my mom and really getting her to introduce me to the business world. It's crazy to think that I would be stepping along her shoes and following her journey in a different way. But yeah, I would say you're right. I think with family and their upbringing, it definitely that's what has encouraged this passion and going into it. Your mom sounds like an amazing, supportive woman. And look (laughs) at you, all the success. You're only 25. Damn. I mean, my goodness. I'm actually 32, but (laughs) I wish I was 25 again. Jeez. (laughs) Hey, I'm just throwing it out there. That that was, it was was close, right? It could have been like, it could have went the opposite way if I wasn't careful. Like It could have. You're right. I appreciate that. I'm glad that I look like I'm 25. (laughs) national you talked about going national i don't know like what all you're allowed to talk about right now like where you're at this is super cool to me and like the people listening probably because hard work can pay off you got to go about things right yeah some people have more advantages than other but walk us through like what's going on how it happened and like where you're at with it because that's intriguing yeah so i went national and what does that mean when we say that right going national i guess i should have 
specified it. Sorry. Oh, no, Sorry to cut fine. you off. No, no, no. It's fine. So national. So like I said, this started as Makers of Maine, just focusing on Maine makers. I decided to go just covering America, USA makers, just because it made sense in terms of getting to know our country, getting to know a place that I've resided my entire life when it comes to the maker community. And I've noticed as I buy things, you know, like in China and other countries that I really need to focus on what is being made here because you don't see that very often. Like you don't see tags like that on products anymore. So I decided to really expand that due to the fact that this whole project was inspired by Anthony Bourdain. He started a show along with Belvini Whiskey on YouTube called Raw Craft. And he goes and highlights one craftsman, women maker per episode that really shares a unique story, but it's a video. It's a YouTube show. And I was like, well, I want to do it as a podcast, but in order to go national, I really needed to partner up with, I wanted to kick this off with somebody that I was like, all right, like I want to do it with somebody that Bourdain has interviewed and doing a different version of the story or like dive deeper into a story that he hasn't told. So I actually went out to Washington state and interviewed Bob Kramer, who is like the world's renowned chef knife maker. He's huge at what he does. He's amazing at his craft. His knives are worth thousands of dollars. Like this man doesn't mess. He makes his own steel that goes into these knives. Like that's how amazing he is at his craft. So I was super honored that he agreed to do an interview with me because this guy doesn't need any more exposure. I mean, he's been on Bourdain show. He's been on Food Network. I mean, he's been all over. And I told him about what I was doing. I told him, this is what I want to do. And he said, I believe in you. And he said, I'd be more than happy to be a part of it. And that's what I said. I said, all right, I'm going to go national. So I kicked off the series, taking a step back. I kicked it off in Maryland just because that is where I'm from. And I wanted to build that connection between myself and how I grew up in the maker's world and small business world and, and being a part of that community. Then went out to Washington State interviewed him as well as a couple other makers in that area. And a lot of people found me just organically through being out, you know, with these makers. And I got a phone call from a major national television broadcasting streaming company while I was out there. I won't say who it is, but that's fine. Yeah. And I, and they said, you know, we really love the structure of your podcast and what you're doing and the vision of it. Have you ever thought about turning this into a television series? And I said, I mean, yeah, in the future, but oh my goodness, I'm only two years into this project. I didn't even think this was going to turn into a TV series right away. So yeah, I thought about it after a couple of months after they contacted me. And I got to a point where I was like, you know, maybe this is time to do it. I mean, this is the right time to do it because with everything going on in our world, with everything with the supply chain issues, everything in the news, I'm just like, maybe this is the time to lift up these makers from a video aspect, but then also continuing the podcast. So I'll be doing both. So that's what's been going on. So I not only have I gone national with the podcast, I'm also now creating sort of this concept to how can I take my podcast and turn it into a TV series, which is very hard. So yeah. that's been interesting. <laughs> No. Yeah. That's a whole other level. How much can you tell us like how far in on this are you? How much of you recording have you done for this? So for the video series, I just got done my pilot episode. So it's just shooting it, just the footage. I haven't even gone through the editing process yet, but there's been multiple companies on the table that are interested in seeing this. So this is a big deal. So that's where I'm at right now. I'm sort of at the phase of finalizing this pilot and then pushing it out to these companies that are interested in seeing it. Yeah. Getting ready to yeah, pitch. Yeah. Then see what happens. So yeah, that's, that's, uh, that is awesome. Completely yeah. awesome. Yeah. I, We're all rooting for thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to kind of get to know the lay of the land of television because I just never thought I would get to a spot like this. Like podcasting so easy. You could do it from your home. And like, I have two kids at home and it's very flexible schedule. And, you know, I mean, gosh, we're doing this right now at like 6.30 and almost 6.30 at night. And it's kind of like, it's nice. Like you could do this anywhere. 
television, it's a little different. Like you have to go and travel a little bit more and stuff. And the time frame of television is very short. So I just have to be very strategic in the storytelling. So it's definitely like a lot of lessons learned in terms of how I can go about doing that. But I think I'm partnering up with the right people to make that happen. You know, I'm really proud to be an indie podcaster, but I do know one of the things that I have the most difficult time keeping up with is editing this very podcast. It kicks my butt every week, but I will tell you, I did find a solution to this and and a team that I can trust to edit my podcast, the team at How's It Podcasting. I met these guys online and I'm not going to lie, I was a little skeptical at first, right? Like this is my baby. And for me to trust somebody else with it was a really big deal. I did give them a shot and it just, I've just been so satisfied with the results. They understand that you don't have the most amount of money to spend. They have very affordable options to edit your podcast. I do think it'll help you keep your podcast going longer and help you maintain that level of creativity that you're needing because that needs to be your main focus is actually creating the content. I want you to reach out to them and give them a shot. How's it podcasting? So it's H-O-W-Z-I-T podcasting. On Twitter, you can find them at How's It WP. Same with Instagram, How's It WP. And on Facebook, look up How's It Podcasting. Their email is How's It WP at gmail.com. This will all be in the show notes, no worry. But if you really want to spend that time focusing on the content you're creating and, and not just spending hours and hours beyond hours editing, I highly encourage you to check out How's It Podcast Editing. I was going to ask you that, like the content creation piece of it is completely different because it's not long form necessarily, but I mean, it's got to be a challenge because the way you, like you said, your storytelling has to be, it probably has to be different the way you're phrasing it and wording it, but then it also has to be different, like how you're approaching, like how long it is before you get into something. Right. Completely different, I'm sure. It is very, very different. And I would recommend to anybody like, you know, if your podcast gets turned into a TV series, just be mindful of like, you know, you have the chance to really listen into the audio before you get into the video footage, because I'm learning that as I go, because I, I mean, you could probably relate to this. Like we know how to tell a story when you're listening to audio, because that's what we're used to. You could still do that with video. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to lose that touch because I feel like that's still very important. That's what I'm used to. So yeah, I feel like that's one thing I've been learning through this process. It's like, you could still treat it as a podcast. So that's nice and hopeful. <laughs> what's another challenge that you've had? Like, what's a difference that we wouldn't think about necessarily that's been like hard for you? <sighs> well, now with, with the video side of it, it's a team and it's a big team effort. So you've got people that are helping you with directing and producing and shooting and sound engineering and editing. And it's like, whoa, my baby, which I started in my bedroom closet in my home, it was just a podcast is now being blown up into a TV series. It's like, you have to put a lot of trust in individuals that are on your team. And I'm trying to be very strategic with that because this project is still all about giving back to makers and telling their stories. And I want my team to be as passionate as I am going into it. And I don't want to be rolled over when it comes to partnering up with some of these networks. So I'm trying to be very, very mindful of that and just being with a trusting, passionate team. And I'm getting there, but it definitely takes time because you have to go about like really getting to know these people, but you only have so much time to get to know them because these broadcasting companies want this material like ASAP, like yesterday. So I'm trying to be slow, but, you know, strategic as possible with this. I'm just doing it on my own pace. And I think that's fine with me. So it has to be a challenge, like creating content. Like you said, like you start out like in your closet, in your bedroom, and then you have all these people around you. It has to be like so distracting. And then like, you don't want to lose your ability to like tell a good story. Right. Then with the other end of like what you were talking about, the about going on to like TV and the networks wanting something like you have to like make sure that you don't lose in your project does not lose who you are. I'm sure like, has that been like a concern at all? Like you have to really find somebody that is like all in on what you're doing because you don't want to like alter the course at all. Exactly. No, I've thought about that long and hard because a lot of people know my podcast 
personality and who I am on social media, my website. And I feel as though that I've done a good job in making sure that's maintained even in the TV series. And I mean, anybody that's going to be on TV is going to be so nervous, especially with all these cameras and equipment around you. But I find that, you know, with my experience, like for instance, I played volleyball and like the hardest part about volleyball is serving a ball. You're literally on the back lines and you have the ball in your hand. Everyone's looking at you and waiting for you to serve that ball over the net. And man, it is intense. If you do not get that ball over the net, you're going to look awful. It's going to bring the team vibe down. It's going to bring the fan vibe down. It's going to bring your coach down. And what I was taught in like my athletic, you know, journey and being a volleyball player was mental kind of journey, like how to handle those types of situations. Mental toughness. Exactly. And I think having that, and I'm so grateful for those who taught me that throughout my volleyball career, is that I'm in the zone. I'm in a different zone when I'm on camera and I only focus on my subjects. I understand the vibe. I want them to be comfortable. I tell them, hey, I'm right here. Just ignore these guys around us. I know you know your story. Let's go out there and tell it. And I feel like it's very inspiring. And it's like, I don't think a lot of other people would do that. I really don't think a lot of hosts would be like, you know, let's just do this. Like, let's be a cheerleader and like, let's do this together. Like, I don't want to set up my people to fail. And I call them my people because they are my community. These guys that I did this pilot episode with, they're my friends. They're my brothers and my sisters. Like I can reach out to them anytime and give them a hug and like, we're there for one another. And that's what I want to do with every subject that I have as a part of this TV series. Because we are a community of creatives and we can all interrelate and we all have something to share and something to like really tell to one another. So I feel like that's definitely something. It's definitely that mental toughness, but also at the same time, it's like, let's take a step back. We're just having a conversation with friends and we're having some deep conversations. And these cameras are just here to to like record it and just pretend they're not there. (laughs) I think like what makes it all work is because I'm going to say this and people are going to be like, you don't even, you don't even know who she is, Jeff. How can you say this? But I think like the most important thing is you're a good person. Why are you going to say that, Jeff? Because I've gone through some things recently and like, I'm not public about it at all, but I had to reschedule once. I think you had to reschedule the first time because something happened with, you know, you had a family situation come up or something, but I needed to reschedule just because I wasn't in a good place. And you were like really supportive and you had a really kind couple of emails that I really, really appreciated. And it meant a lot to me. And that's when I knew right then I was like, I definitely need to link up and meet with her because I can tell she's a good person. And I think that's like the most important part of building a community. Like, like that's hands down the most important part. Like you have to be genuine about it and care. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, we're all struggling, especially right now with everything going on and especially like with, you know, with kids and not even just kids, just like work, everything. And I think that we're in a very questionable life right now because of COVID and everything. We have no idea where everything, everything and anything's going. So yeah, I feel like that. I just want to help lift everybody up. That's just who I am as an individual. Sometimes it It could be a bad thing because I don't look after myself, but I find that helping others makes me thrive. It makes me be the who I am today. And I just want people to be happy. And that's, I felt like I really related to you because I feel like I spend so much time with even this project. It's about helping others and like either highlighting like great things that others are doing or introducing them to people who are, and they can really learn something from them. And it is hard after a while because you do forget about yourself and you start to feel like I'm not getting back like all that I put in. But then like at the end of the day, you just, you feel it in your heart. You're like, Hey, like that's not why I'm doing it. And that's like, you know, that's what really keeps you going. And that's, that's why the community aspect is really important. Yeah, exactly. Especially in the podcasting world too, because we are creatives. We're makers ourselves because we're making amazing stories and you know, it's hard to be in the position that we're in because I feel like we always have to have a positive face because I don't think the conversation would go very well with the guests. So we have pretty hard jobs and it's like kind of we all have to lean in together. Yeah. 
And when you get dozens of DMs a day asking for advice and help, sometimes it's hard, but like you just really care and you want to make sure that everybody is at least getting some sort of support because some people don't get that at all. Right. And like I said, community is a huge part of it. Like what are some other things that have helped you build a community? You talked about being sincere. You talked about being strategic just to kind of like put a bow on this conversation. And community is like a really big buzzword right now. It is. But you don't want to take it lightly because it's important. It's like, what's something else that has helped you build a community? Oh, man, community. So I feel like, you know, as much as I don't like technology, but I would say social media has been a big one because that's how I found my maker community. I mean, a lot of people just spread the word and then they go and find some of these amazing images of people crafting things or just see an image of me and they they saw me on the news. Like, I feel like that's been super helpful. And I tell my audience all the time, I'm like, one day we're going to have this huge maker community party. We're going to get everybody together and everybody's going to meet in person. Because a lot of these makers tell me all the time, I've only talked to these people on the internet. Like we've never, ever talked in person. And I'm like, well, that needs to change. but. You know, another thing, too, in regards to community as well, and I'm pretty grateful for the state that I live in, is that it's a small community. So as I'm walking out and about, somebody stops me and they're like, oh, my goodness, you're that girl that has this podcast. And I'm like, yeah, (laughs) but like, it's just such a small community. It's something I'm not very used to because I grew up in Maryland and Maryland's big. I mean, you got Baltimore, D.C., like all this crazy traffic, like here, you don't get that. And I think I'm super grateful for the community that I reside in. I'm sure you could appreciate this too, because Indiana's got some great small towns as well. And, you know, I think it's just the people you surround yourself with. And I think here in Maine, people get that and they understand that maker and craft community very well, but they also understand that we're all going through life and having its challenges, its curves, positives, ebbs and flows. Like, you know, and I think that that's why I love people that I live with. It's just that we all get it. We're going to have deep conversations about it. It's been an awesome conversation today. It's been an awesome chat. I do want to give you a second though, to tell everybody where to find all the great things that you're doing. You can find me at makersoftheusa.com on Instagram. I'm at Makers of the US and Facebook. I'm at Makers of the USA. And I can be found on any podcast platform from Apple, Google, Spotify, you name it. But that's how you can find me. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. We'll definitely have to keep in touch. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening and thanks for telling a friend. But more importantly, thank you for supporting independent content creators. I hope you enjoyed this episode and continue to listen to the upcoming ones. I'm really trying to do something special here by highlighting all the amazing things all these amazing content creators are doing. I hope you continue to join me on my journey. I'm Jeff, a.k.a. Podcast Father, the Indie Podcaster. Keep being you. Keep being great.